As for the scripture reading, we'll turn to the gospel according to John and read chapter 17. John chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. These things spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which Thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify Thou me with Thine own self, with the glory which I had with Thee before the world was. I have manifested Thy name unto the men which Thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and Thou gavest them me, and they have kept Thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world but for them which Thou hast given me, for they are Thine, and all mine are Thine, and Thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to Thee, Holy Father. Keep through Thine own name those whom Thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, Even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. And the glory which Thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and Thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that Thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that Thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them Thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith Thou hast loved me may be in them, 
and I in them. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. The sermon this evening is taken from the scripture we read, John 17, verse 24, where we read, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. The sermon is by uh, Reverend Robert Trail. I uh, perhaps can refresh your memories. He lived from 1642 to 1716. That's the time of the Scottish Covenanters. He was a Covenanter, but was exiled and spent many years in Holland and returned again to England when the persecution was over. He lived to the age of 74 and had several Presbyterian charges in the city of Kent and in the city of London. The sermon is the prayer of the Lord Jesus before he was crucified. I can read chapter 18, verse 1. Then it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden into the which he went, entered with his disciples, the garden of Gethsemane. This is the night before his death. And if you go back and the sermon will speak about it, we have from John 14, 15, and 16, we have the last words of Jesus or his last sermon. And in chapter 17, we have his last prayer. And when you think about this last prayer of Jesus, where you hear him word for word praying to his Father, your children draw near and hear the dear Lord Jesus praying for his people to his Father before he goes into the awful suffering and death. You have heard many a good text taken out of the Word of God. But though all be good, there is none better than this. Love the text and love, above all, the blessed first speaker of it, and you will be more fit to profit by what you hear spoken in his name from it. The best of all sermons, which we can read in chapters 14, 15, and 16, is concluded with the best of all prayers in this chapter 17. In this prayer, properly the Lord's Prayer, for that in Matthew 6, verse 9, is rather the pattern given for our praying, praying than the Lord's Prayer, there are but few petitions, but they are all great ones. He prays first for himself in his own glory in verse 1 to 6, and second for his people to the end of this chapter. This verse 24 contains his last petition for them. And he uses the title Father five times in this prayer. Three times singly or by itself, as in verses 1 5 and, and 24. Twice, with an addition, he says, Holy Father, as in verse 11. And also, Righteous Father, in verse 25. I take up two things in this petition. First of all, the matter of Christ's prayer, or the parts of his prayer. And secondly, The manner of our Lord's asking, he says, I will. A singular way of praying or a a very rare or only one time type praying. That's what singular means. Now, the matter of Christ's prayer, and in these are four things. So, four parts, Reverend Trail wants to point out in his prayer. First, the party or the people 
he prays for, they whom thou hast given me. Only Jesus Christ could pray thus for the elect as elect. Secondly, the blessing he prays for to them, that they may be with me where I am. Where was Christ when he said this? He was going to the garden, to his agony, to take that night and to be crucified the next morning and laid in his grave the next evening. But here our Lord is praying as one in heaven. Verse 11 and 12. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. And he prays to have his people with him in heaven. He loved them so well that he came to the world where they were. He loved them so well that he endured what they deserved. And here he expresses his love in desiring that they may be with him where he is. Christ and his people must be together. Now the third part of his prayer. In the matter of this prayer of Christ, we have the end or the goal. Why Christ prays for this blessing to them. That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. Why would Christ have his people with him where he is? that they may behold his glory. Are they to receive no glory of their own? Yes, a great deal, surely. Yea, they have some already. Verse 22, the glory which thou gavest me to give, I have given them. And a great deal more they are to receive in heaven. But it stands in and is advanced to their beholding Christ's glory. Had they not beheld Christ's glory before? John 1, verse 14. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. We all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And Isaiah, in chapter 6, saw His glory and spake of Him. Why then does our Lord speak of the necessity of his people's being with him where he is, that they might behold his glory, since he can manifest his glory, and they by grace can behold it, even when they are where they are, and not yet where he is? The reason is this, because believers now, though by faith they can see something of Christ's glory, Yet it is but a very little they do see, or can see. The light is small, and their eye but weak. But in that day that our Lord prays for, the discoveries of His glory will be greater, and the seeing eye of the glorified will be stronger than now we can conceive. And now the fourth matter of this prayer we have the argument on which our Lord prays for this blessing to his people. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. You know that this phrase, before the foundation of the world, is an usual scripture word for eternity. For the foundation of the world and time began together. Creatures and time began together. Time is properly the measure of the duration of a creature. The God inhabiteth eternity. Isaiah 57 verse 15. Creatures dwell or sojourn in time. So that this argument of our Lord's is, For thou lovest me from eternity, and it hath a mighty force in it. If our Lord had said, I pray that they may be with me where I am, for thou lovest them before the foundation of the world, he had spoke what he had oft told them, for they were given to Christ in love. But the argument is stronger 
as Christ expresses it, For thou lovest me, I love them, and would have them where I am. They love me, and would be with me where I am. Thou lovest them, and wilt have them where I am. But here is one argument more. For thou lovest me, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as entrusted with the office of a Savior, and charged with the chosen, was and is the object of his Father's eternal delight and love. And on this love, the salvation of all the elect stands more firm than the pillars of heaven or earth. So much for the words of this verse. And from this little glance I have given you of them, you may plainly perceive that here is a rich and deep mine, better than of gold that perishes. The Lord help us to dig and find treasure and to be enriched by it. The second thing from the text, the manner of Christ praying here, where he says, I will, is a singular manner. About it, I would premise Three things. First, this is a way or manner of praying that we never read the like of it used by any saint in the Word. Some of them have been very familiar with God. The Lord hath encouraged them much by His condescension to them. Yet notwithstanding of this, I will is to be heard or read of in their prayers. I will is too high for a supplicant at God's footstool. Abraham was a great intimate with God. The first believer honored with the noble name of the friend of God. Yet this great friend, when pleading for Sodom in Genesis 18, with what deep humility is his confidence mixed? Again, when pleading for Ishmael, In Genesis 17, he saith, Oh, that Ishmael might live in thy sight. Nothing like this, these words, I will. Abraham's grandson, Jacob, came a little nearer to this in Genesis 32, verse 26. Let me go, saith the angel, for the day breaketh. Jacob answers, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Give me thy blessing, and go when thou wilt. When he had got the blessing, he got an halting thigh and a humbled heart while he lived, as he hints in Genesis 32, verse 30, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Not a word or thought of this. I have seen God face to face. I have wrestled with him hand to hand. I have prevailed. No, he rather wonders that he got away alive out of God's hands. Write Jacob's, true Israel's, in and on their greatest prevailings with God and blessings from him, are lowly, humble believers, yea, humbled by God's advancing of them. Moses That great wrestler with God for Israel, though he expressed a holy resolve, yet nothing appears like this, I will. In Exodus 32, verse 10, Let me alone, saith the Lord, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them. It is strange that one man should, as it were, hold the Lord's hands that one man's faith should stop the execution of a just sentence against a sinful people. Surely you may conclude that the Lord is easy to be entreated. Again, in Exodus 33, verse 15, Moses said, If thy presence go not with us, carry us not up hence. It is as good for us to die here as to go any whither Without thy presence, the wilderness, though waste and howling, 
and Canaan, though the glory of all lands, are alike to Moses without God's presence. Again, in Numbers 14, verse 12, Moses has a great offer from the Lord. I will destroy this people and make of thee a great nation and mightier than they. Moses, in his zeal to God's glory, refuses this offer and pleads still and prevails. Yet never I will is in all his importunity. No believer ever did or ought to speak so to God. They should all ask according to his will and forget and deny their own will. Yet Christ did say, I will, and might well say so. Well, secondly, this I will is not in a promise to us, but in a prayer to his Father. So the Lord Jesus wasn't speaking this I will to us as a promise, but he was speaking it to his Father as a prayer. When the Lord promise, what, when the Lord promises to do or give good to his people, it is very becoming to use this style, I will do or give or be so and so to my people. And it is this, I will, in a promise that faith fixes on, as Jacob did in Genesis 32 verse 12, thou saidst, I will surely do thee good. But our Lord is here praying, though I own that there is a great promise implied in it, as we shall hear. And thirdly, there is nothing like this in all the account we have of Christ's prayers at other times and other occasions. We find that our blessed Savior was much given to prayer alone. Bless him for it. And love secret prayer the better, that he used it himself and thereby hallowed it to our use. How our Lord spent those nights in the mountain in prayer, and what he prayed for, and how, we cannot tell. Except by that in Hebrews 5 verse 7, there are prayers and supplications offered up with strong crying and tears. Believers, You'd sometimes, when your hearts are full, want to be far from all company, that you may pour out your complaint to the Lord. Blessed Jesus did so in the days of his flesh, and filled the silent night with his crying, and watered the cold earth with his tears, more precious than the dew of Hermon, or any moisture next to his blood that ever fell on God's earth since the creation. Never were such sinless, precious tears in God's bottle. Psalm 56, verse 8. Let yours drop, believers, and mix in the same bottle with His, and on this account sow them in hope, and you shall reap in joy. But for Christ's prayers recorded in the Gospel, we find our Lord prayed very humbly, though confidently, when he prays in his agony, not a word of I will, but Abba, let this cup pass from me, if thou wilt. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Christians, behold the amazing difference betwixt Christ's way of praying against his own hell so I may call it, his own hell on the cross, the forsaking of his Father, and his praying for our heaven. When praying for himself, it is, Father, if thou will, let this cup pass from me. And no wonder, for every drop in that cup was wrath and curse and death. One drop of it is everlasting poison, to all that taste it, but to Jesus, the Prince of Life, this cup he drank cheerfully. John 18, verse 11. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? But when Christ is praying for his people's heaven, 
it is, Father, I will that they may be with me where I am. Again, when our Lord is dying on the cross, He prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And again, just at dying, Father, into Thy hands I commend my spirit. All humble supplications, none of them so high and lofty, but yet it it well became Him, as this I will. I own that Christ, in one instance on the cross, put forth His divine power and acted like a king and God, as you can read in Luke 23, verse 42. One of the malefactors that was crucified with Him, the happiest death ever man had next to dying for Christ, was to die with the Savior and to die receiving Christ's grace and Christ's path to heaven. Whatever Thomas meant in his words, John 11, verse 16, let us go that we may die with him. This happy malefactor, the thief on the cross, had the best of it fulfilled on him. He died with Christ and got everlasting eternal life in the same day. Surely that word was eminently fulfilled in this man. Better is the day of death when the day of one's birth, than the day of one's birth. This man prays marvelously, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Our Lord answers more marvelously, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. As if Christ had said, Can thy faith take me up as a king and the disposer of heaven, notwithstanding this thick and dark veil that is now upon me? I will act as a God and Savior to thee. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. These words have no small aspect on this text. I will that they be with me where I am. Now let us see what may be in this singular word in Christ's prayer. I will. What is in it? No saint ever prayed so. Christ himself in this prayer only here uses this word. There must be some singular or some unique, special things that made our Lord use this word in prayer when he said, I will, and them I would look into. So first of all, what made this so special, why he used this singular word, First, we may lawfully conceive that herein there is a breaking out of his divine glory as the Son of God equal with the Father, as you have it in Philippians 2, where the Apostle marks three things about Christ, none of which must be forgotten by Christians. The divine dignity of his person, verse 6. The depth of his low and humble state, Verses 7 and 8. And the height of his exalted state. Verses 9 and 10. So does the apostle to the Hebrews in chapter 1 verse 3. Now though Christ humbled and exalted state had and have their several and distinct appearances. Yet as this, yet as his divine dignity was still the same in both states and in his lowest and in his highest, so there were now and then some beamings of his glory, even in his lowest state, and in his triumphant entry to Jerusalem, even when he was going to be crucified. So we may think that this singular word, I will, is used by Christ to display his divine glory. For it is a word that no mere man can use. And secondly, our Lord had promised it to his disciples in John 14, verse 2 and 3. And therefore praise thus for it. 
And we must think that the doctrine delivered by Christ in his last sermon of consolation and this last prayer of his, though in the first place designed for his apostles, yet are the common portion of all believers in Jesus Christ. Now Christ had promised in John 14, verse 2 and 3, that where he was, there his people should be also. If a poor believer have at any time a firm hold on a promise of God, how will he cleave to it, plead upon it, and urge it? But who can conceive what confidence of faith Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had and did use in pleading with his Father for the fulfillment of all his own promises to his people? Besides, all Christ's promises to his people were made by him in his Father's name. No wonder then that our Lord says, I will. Well, thirdly, Christ here gives us a copy and pattern of his intercession in heaven. That so much is spoke of. Christ here speaks as within the veil. As you see in verse 4 and 11 and 12. As if he had done all his work and were no more in the world. He had done so much, had but a little more to do, which also was speedily to be dispatched. Christ's intercession in heaven is a kind and powerful remembrance of his people and of all their concerns, managed with state and majesty, not as a supplicant at the footstool, but as a crowned prince on the throne at the right hand of the Father. This may be one reason of this great I will. Fourthly, here our Lord is making His will, like making His last will. And therefore, I will is fitly put in. Christ is making His last will and testament and praying it over to His Father which is sealed the next day with his blood. And here he tells what he wills to his people, even that they may be with him where he is. And nothing greater or better can be willed for them. Blessed forevermore are they that have this will and bequeath to them. And you have a word like this in Luke 2 verse 29. I appoint unto you a kingdom. I bequeath, dispose it, make it over to you, as the word may be rendered. Now, fifthly, our Lord had the price of this glory in his hand, ready now to lay it down. And therefore he demands the purchase, for Christ was taken this night and died the next day. The price of the redeemed and of their salvation, a price agreed upon in the everlasting covenant, a price of infinite value in itself, a price the Father's wisdom and justice demanded, a price the Son promised to lay down in the fullness of time, a price on the payment whereof so great things were promised to Christ and his seed. This price is now in Christ's hand ready, presently to be laid down. No wonder then, if Christ demand the purchase in this high word, I will. Believers, it passes all your thoughts. It passes the highest flights of your faith to conceive that high assurance and confidence that our Lord Jesus had of the acceptance and success of that sacrifice of himself that he was now upon offering to his Father. Hence comes this great word, I will. This I will is but an echo to the known will of his Father. It doth not become us to say in our prayers, I will, because we do 
not perfectly know God's will. And when our desires clash with His will, we do but dash against a rock. But Christ knew perfectly that the thing He prays for was the will of His Father. John 6, verse 38. When a believer hath a sure knowledge of God's will, his faith may plead boldly on it. We read of one bold word of blessed Dr. Martin Luther. He hearing of the dangerous sickness of an eminent minister of the gospel, prayed for him, prevailed with the Lord for his life, and wrote to him later that he was assured that the Lord would restore him and preserve him to outlive Luther, which came to pass. In the close of this letter, he writes, Let my will be done, mine, Lord, because thine. And lastly, this I will, in Christ's prayer for his people, shows how much his heart is set upon the eternal happiness of his people. He prays for it, with all his heart. On this sweet theme, I would offer a few things. Let us consider how Christ's love and will was on the necessary price of their salvation. How dear soever it was to him, whatever it cost him, his love was on laying it down. Luke 12, verse 50. I have a baptism he says, to be baptized with, and how am I straitened or pained till it be accomplished? And it was a baptism in his own blood. Luke 22, verse 15. With desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And it was his last meal. Love to his father and love to his sheep made our Lord long greatly to pay the price of redemption. There are several thoughts in men's hearts about Christ dying. Some think of Christ's death as brought about by the wicked hands of sinners. This is a poor thought, if there be no more. This thought is natural to any that read the history of His death. Carnal men may hate Judas, that betrayed Him, Pilate that condemned Him, the priest that cried, Crucify Him, and the people that did it. If this be all, I may say, the devils have a higher thought of Christ's death and that which comes nearer to the truth than this sorry one. Some go further and think of Christ's death as it was a fulfilling of the purpose and Word of God concerning Him. This Christ teaches us in Luke 24, verse 26. And the apostles frequently in their preaching of Christ, there is a higher thought of Christ's death, and that is that Christ died by the stroke of God's law and justice for his people. Justice roused itself against our Lord. Zechariah 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. And against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd. This sword was drawn and furbished and did enter into his soul. Isaiah 53, verse 5, He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. Better were it that a man had never heard of Christ and of his death than to hear and not to know that his death was for his sins. This is Paul's first doctrine he taught, and he is an ignorant and proud preacher that follows not this pattern. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The best thought of Christ's death is that he died out of love to his people. Love made him come in the way of justice. Justice and the law says, as it were, thou or they must die. They have sinned. The law must be fulfilled. 
Justice must be satisfied. Blessed Jesus answers, I love them too well to let them die. I will rather die for them that they may live. Christ's death is still laid on His love. He loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Revelations 1 verse 5. That is, He loved us so that He shed His own blood for our sins. And then in the same love He washed us from our sins in and by that blood which He shed in love. Oh, such love, such blood, such washing. Here is salvation, and here only. Now secondly, consider as Christ's love was much set on the paying the price of redemption, so was His love and will as much set on the persons of the redeemed. He laid down the price in love to the purchase. How can I, how can it enter into a man's thoughts that the Son of God should lay down so great a price and not know what he was to take up for it? That he should die and not know for whom, nor who should be the better for it? His dying was in love. And did he not know whom he loved? His love is still spoken of as distinguishing and particular for his body, his people, his sheep, whom he knew. John 10. The ways and means of bringing his redeemed to glory were also much in Christ's love and will. John 17, verse 6. I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. In John 10, verse 16, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, that is, are not of the Jews, but but of the elect Gentiles. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd, every mean of grace. Every blessing of the means, every drop of grace you receive, as Christ is the giver, so His love and will is the bestowing it on you. All things that accompany salvation are given with the love and will of Christ. Christ's will is upon the goal itself, eternal glory. It is first in His design, though it be last in our enjoyment, as in this text. He will have His people with Him where He is. There is one thing I would exhort you to from this doctrine. That Christ's love and will is fixed on the eternal glory of His people. And it is this. This is the one thing. I would exhort you to let believers learn to their, to own their eternal salvation as springing from the will of Christ as well as from the blood of Christ. There was a saving will in Christ to, in shedding his saving blood by the, which will we are sanctified. Hebrews 10 verse 10. That is, justified and saved through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. What this will is, is declared in the foregoing verses to be the Father's will, commanding the true sacrifice and the Son's will in offering this commanded sacrifice. By this will, we are saved. This will thus fixed, thus accomplished in Christ's death. There are three great advantages which we shall reap by this looking on heaven, the prize of our calling, as willed by Jesus Christ. First, it will stir you up to praise and glorify Him. He that took on Him the burden of our souls and the care of our salvation 
should surely bear the burden of all our songs for salvation and for the hope of it. So the Apostle sings hearty praise to Jesus Christ, for salvation can never be given unless men know that all their salvation is owing to Him alone, to His will, and to His blood. If a man ascribe any bit of his salvation to anything or person beside Christ, that thing or person will bear away or rob somewhat of the glory of salvation. But since all salvation is from Christ, all the glory of it shall be given him. Second, this will make your faith in Christ strong. What is strong faith? Christians usually think that strong faith has in it peace, joy, and comfort. But these are but the effects of it, and separable also, as you can read in Psalm 22, verse 1. Never was faith near so strong in any saint as it was in the man Christ Jesus on the cross. And yet no joy or comfort was tasted by him then. But as to faith in believers, strong faith is when a believer gets far in, into the love and will of Jesus Christ. Now this doctrine opens up Christ's love and will about our salvation. Let us then enter into it. Faith makes several approaches to Christ for and about salvation. It seeks and finds and sees atoning, reconciling blood flowing from Christ's love. Faith sees life springing and growing out of Christ's grave. Alas, many are busy about Moses' grave and have no business with Christ's grave. A believer sees eternal life springing from Christ's grave and death. Faith goes further, and through the blood of atonement, this life-giving death, it enters into Christ's love and will that was in His redeeming. As there was life to us in His death, so there was love to us in His dying for us. But can faith go any further? Yes, only one step more, and that is to the highest fountain of all this, even God's eternal purpose, which He purposed in Jesus Christ our Lord, Ephesians 3.11. So that faith begins at Christ's death, rises with Him in His resurrection, sees the virtue and power of all in Christ's love, and then rises to the love of the Father, that sent Him. So that purpose of grace from which the Savior and all salvation does proceed, can faith go any further? No. Here faith is at a stand. The believer is saved and yet sinks and is overwhelmed in this depth. And like one swallowed up cries out, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Romans 11, verse 33. When faith gets a view of the unsearchable riches of God's grace in, by, and through Jesus Christ, then the believer longs to be in heaven, to behold the fountainhead of all grace and glory. Faith longs to cease to be faith. This is a strange and strong act of faith, a strange desire in a believer. Oh, when shall I cease to be a believer and become a seer? When shall the glass be done away and the full-eyed vision of glory succeed? When shall both faith and hope cease and love fill their room? The seeing of Christ's heart and will about our salvation will enable you to pray and labor rightly for glory. 
What is it to do it rightly? It is to labor with courage and to labor with humility. And a Christian's work prospers when those are united. They always should be. How boldly may a believer say, I would be in heaven since Christ wills it. And how humbly should he say, I would be there since his own will about it signifies nothing and Christ's will is all. Now here is an objection. How shall I know that I am in Christ's will for salvation? If I did know it, then I would give thanks. I would believe firmly and would labor hard to obtain the possession of this glory. Here's an answer. To this I offer three things. First, consider how they behave themselves that were that with their own ears heard those very words from Christ's own mouth. I mean, the words of this prayer. It is a vain thought, that, or an empty thought, that readily rises in all our hearts, that if we had been present and had heard Christ praying thus for us in a special, particular way, that we might be with him where he is, that then we would believe our salvation if it were in the saddest distress. But now consider what great encouragement to faith Christ gave them. He told them in chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. What more could they desire? than to have Christ telling them to their faces, you and I must indeed part for a little while, but you and I shall quickly meet again, never to part more. They did also with their ears hear Christ praying over his promise to them, to his Father, I will that they be with me where I am. Could such believers, under all those advantages so great, ever stagger again? Yes, almost as soon as this encouraging sermon and prayer is ended, their faith was almost at an end too. John 16, verse 31. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come that shall that ye shall all shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone i speak this to check the vanity of that thought in christians that if they had but sufficient ground of the assurance of christ's love and of eternal glory they would believe in every difficulty and trial yet you see how they behaved that had such grounds of faith from Christ's own lips, while bodily present with them, which you cannot expect or desire. And I hope none of you will imagine that if you had been there, then you would have behaved better than they did. Grounds of faith, if never so great, yet if not attended with the influence of the spirit of faith, will never keep faith in life and vigor. And a second answer to that question. What reason have you to doubt your interest in this prayer of Christ? You may say, I am so vile and unworthy that I cannot believe that Christ willed me to be with him. If this be all, it is nothing, yea, worse than nothing. Hath not Christ willed eternal glory to many as bad as ever you were? Did he ever will heaven for worthiness in the persons that are to receive it? Is it not always willed to the praise of his own grace and love as the giver, and never as recompense to the worth and loveliness of the receiver? Christ will mend you ere he bring you to heaven. And great work it is to make you meet for it. Colossians 1 verse 12. A work that must be done 
and that he only can do, and he can easily do it, right preparation for glory flows from the faith of Christ's good will to give it. It is a weak and ignorant but common thought of Christians that they ought not to look for heaven nor trust Christ for eternal glory till they be well advanced in holiness and meetness for it. But as the first sanctification of our natures flows from our faith and trust in Christ for acceptance, so our farther sanctification and meanness for glory flows from the renewed and repeated exercise of faith on Him. The hope of glory is purifying. 1 John 3, verse 8. And a third answer. Every believer hath the witness in himself that he hath an interest in Christ's heart and will in this prayer. 1 John 5, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. The Apostle is speaking of the many witnesses in this chapter, 1 John 5. The many witnesses that are given to Jesus Christ as the Savior. Three in heaven, he says in verse 7. Three on earth, he says in verse 8. All are divine witnesses and sufficient grounds of faith in Jesus Christ. He says in verse 9. Now saith the Apostle in verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God, that is, that trusts his soul and its salvation to this so well attested Savior, he hath the witness or testimony in himself. There are three witnesses in heaven, witnesses on earth, and a testimony in the heart of a believer in Christ. Whoever believeth on Christ, that faith is an evidence sufficient if he will require it to speak and will regard its testimony and both of them require actings of faith to persuade him that he hath an interest in Christ's prayer here. On this I would glance at four things and conclude. First of all, believers in Christ, what do you do when you believe? All that all believers did but know what they do when they believe. Do you not, in every distinct act of faith, betrust your guilty, perishing soul to the saving arm of Jesus Christ upon the warrant of all that grace, mercy, and power that belongs to Christ in His office as a Savior? And is not this His willing of eternal glory, a great and glorious beam of that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which you believe to be saved? Acts 15, verse 11. Secondly, how came you by this your faith? It is, is it not a gift? Is it not His gift? He is the author of it. Hebrews 12, verse 2. It is given on Christ's behalf. Philippians 1, verse 29. Whenever you have an evidence in your heart, and it is your own fault if you have it not daily, that you have true faith in Jesus Christ, if it be but weak and cannot mount so high as it ought, raise it by this consideration. Whence came this spark of faith to be kindled in my heart? Did it naturally grow in my heart? No. Time was when I was without it, Ephesians 2, verse 12, and loved to be without it. Did Satan plan it? No, I find him to be the great enemy of it, and I never felt his enemy, his enmity, till I began to trust Jesus Christ. And it is that in me he mainly assaults. Did ministers and the means of grace Plant faith in me. No. I enjoyed them when no faith was wrought in me. And when it is wrought, all their power, without Christ's grace and spirit concurring, cannot raise this faith to act 
and exercise. Therefore, surely, this faith came from Jesus Christ Himself. Was it not from the work and will and love of Christ? How easy and native is this inference. If faith in Christ be the work of His love, how warrantably may I look by that faith for all the good that this love proposes, promises, and prays for me? And thirdly, can you call Him to witness with a good conscience that your great desire and will is to be with Christ in heaven? If the Lord should try you with this question, name that one thing you would have above all. Every believer hath his answer ready. It is, Lord, that I may be with thee where thou art. As David said in Psalm 27, verse 4, of God's house on earth, this I infer, If your love be set on being with Christ where He is, be assured that Christ's love is set on the same blessing for you. Yea, your desire after it flows from His desire for it for you. And fourth, are you willing, yea, pleased and delighted to hold your title to eternal glory by the will and testament of Jesus Christ? Are you willing to have and hold the crown by His tenor only, that it was bought by His blood and willed to you by His testament? Every every believer desires to be in heaven because Christ is there and is pleased to get and keep His place there as willed to Him by Jesus Christ. Heaven is a lovely name and a more lovely thing, but not at all known by many and but little by the best. But yet believers look for it and expect it as the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. They plead for it as much. At last they receive it as grace and eternally the crown, as a crown of grace, as well as a crown of glory. The glorified saint, as soon as he receives this crown, casts it at Christ's feet, or sets it on Christ's head, as if ashamed to wear a crown, where Christ, the only worthy, is. Upon Christ's head are many crowns. Revelations 19, verse 12. His Father puts a crown on Him. Hebrews 2, verse 9. Crowned Him with glory and honor. His Mother, the Church, crowns Him. Song of Solomon 3, verse 11. With a crown of salvation. And every saved person puts on Christ's head the crown of the glory of their particular salvation. To conclude, they that are not willing to give the glory of all salvation to Jesus Christ, shall never receive any salvation from Him. But for you that are willing to receive all from Him, and are delighted to render the glory of all to Him, His heart is towards you. His best wishes are for your good. And He will give you what He has prepared for you, which is exceedingly above. All that can be told you. Amen. Let's close with prayer. O Lord, who can tell Thy glory that Thou hast purchased for Thy people a home in heaven, a place in glory. O Lord, we beseech Thee, teach us what empty and vain things this world has, all flying away, all to be burned and perish. But thy heaven, thy Christ, is enduring forever. Thy word 
shall never fail. And Lord, we pray that we might experience and treasure this treasure, Thee, O Lord Jesus Christ, as the interceding High Priest. O Lord, teach us to prayer, pray, and to look to Thee with expectation, and that it might quicken our steps as we travel through this waste howling wilderness. We plead for Thy help and grace in the further part of this week. O Lord, we pray that as we look to Thee, Thou wilt add all other things. O Lord, give us grace to hunger and thirst for Thy righteousness and to find Thee well providing in every other respect. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.